Okay, welcome to lecture seven. And what we're gonna talk about today is cloud data storage. So we're gonna start with a little bit of background on databases, different types of databases, and some of the motivations behind the move to the cloud. Then we're gonna look into Amazon Web Services as one example of a cloud service provider. Then I'm gonna drill down even more detail, explain you know, what S3 is. Amazon S3, this is the most, probably the most accessible cloud storage uh, service, and explain how to get started with that and explain how you can use it in your mini project. Okay, so databases. So, you know, typically, uh, not so much anymore, but typically, you know, databases were just some software running on a single machine, um, such as, you know, MySQL, so very popular open source server, or sort of more sort of big scale heavy software, such as Oracle. So it's just some software that runs a machine, listens on a particular port, and then you send um, like SQL or structured query language uh, sort of commands or programs almost that are used to access and store data within this, uh, within this program. Then you've got this uh, series of different commands that you can use that with SQL. I don't know if any of you guys done SQL. You can do sort of select, update, delete. It's a very powerful um, way in which you can manipulate, store data and all the rest of it. So when I first started programming, I didn't use databases and just use files and mess around with all these stupid files. But databases are an incredibly powerful way. If you've got a lot of data, you can store the data and retrieve data, search the data. It's nicely structured, it's very efficient, very fast, and you know, it's definitely the way to go. So traditionally, um, databases have these set of properties called ACID, um, which are atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Atomicity means uh, the transactions are all or nothing, so either the whole transaction goes through, the whole set of SQL commands or whatever, the whole sort of change to the database happens, or if the one part fails, the whole, the whole thing fails. And this is so that if something goes wrong, the database isn't left in this inconsistent state. And that's where consistency comes in. So the transactions are bringing the state from one valid state to another. So as I'll explain, you often have uh, links between the different tables. And if the tables aren't updated correctly, these links can be broken and leave the database in an inconsistent state. So isolation, so you want, um, if you're running sort of multiple queries on the database, you want them to, their concurrent execution to be the same as a serial execution. So that, you know, it's fine if you update isolated tables that have no relationship to each other. It's not fine if you up update tables that are tightly coupled to each other. And durability, um, so you know, as I said, it's software and running on a particular machine, and that software is changing the state of files stored in the hard drive. Um, so you want that if the software crashes, you still want the database, you know, to be intact and consistent, all the rest of it. So these ACID properties are what, you know, databases used to have, what everyone thought used, all databases should have. Um, and this is the kind of thing a standard database looks like. So here we have uh, examples of the different tables. And then the sort of, the issue is, or the need for consistency arises because we've got links between these tables. So these, each table typically have like a particular ID, like contact here, contact ID, customer, customer ID, and so on. But like the, um, say so the customer here has maybe order IDs here. So there's like a link between these tables, which is what's uh, indicated with the arrow here. Or there's a link here between contacts here. So this here, the customer will have like a contact ID maybe, or the, there'll be a customer ID there. So the tables are kind of quite tightly coupled together. And so obviously, this is where we're talking about the um, concurrency, I think it is. Um, isolation, yeah, so if you're changing this table, you also need to change this table. So, you know, if you want, so, a, so you probably wanna do serial changes to the database in this case, but there might be possible to do parallel changes to other, other parts of the database. So standard database, as I said, is software running on a single machine, single listening on a port, changing data on a hard drive. But there's obviously some limitations there. What if the machine falls over and dies, or if the hard drive fails? A single machine can only handle a limited number of requests. So if we're trying to run an internet scale application, um, obviously you know, one single machine is not going to handle millions and millions of queries per second. So this leads people to, led people to the idea of a distributed database, and a lot of work's been done on this kind of stuff. So, the idea is we run the database across lots of different machines, but then, then we've got the problem, you know, about how we can synchronize the data. You know, if we've got the customer here on one machine and the contact here on another machine, then we've got to make two separate things to each machine, and what if one, one uh, machine falls over and dies in the middle of the transaction? How does this machine know that that's happened? And it gets all horribly messy. 
And lots of, you know, lots of hard work, as I said, has been spent on trying to solve this problem. And so if you, you know, one way to do this is to have a single machine that is like the database, but then to handle a number, large number of read requests, you just copy that database onto a large number of other machines and they just serve up read-only copies. But then you've got problems with, you know, more dynamic websites, uh, more dynamic data, then how do you keep this all synchronized and updated across lots of machines? Or you can do some kind of, you know, merge each change of occurs or split the data called sharding. So when sharding it means that maybe you've got like half the customers on one machine and the other half on another machine, and somehow all the half of the other bits also split between the machines. But as you can see, it's not going to be a trivial, trivial thing to do. So in the face of these problems with shifting databases across multiple machines, uh, there's been this move towards no SQL databases, particularly when you talk about large-scale databases, internet-scale databases. So, what they, so, the, so the idea with no SQL is we abandon these strict ACID requirements. You know, maybe we can get by without them under many circumstances. And we aim to have something that's simple and fast and very scalable indeed. And so in cloud computing web applications, you know, they're often using these uh, no SQL databases. And there's different ways in which you can build a NoSQL database. You can have key value stores. So that's what we're going to talk about with uh, Amazon S3. You just have a key and then a bunch of data associated with that key, a bit like a hash map. And then you have document stores, uh, which is a bit like a key value store, except you've got a document, um, which is maybe a bit more detailed structure or specific structure in that document. And you've got graph stores, so you've got networks, connections, so on. And then wide column stores. So you, it's, instead of having rows of data, which is more the classic uh, SQL way of working, um, you've got like columns are stored together and that's a more efficient way in which can break the, enables you to efficiently break the database across different machines. So a couple of NoSQL examples, you've got MongoDB or Apache Cassandra. So MongoDB is a pretty popular NoSQL database and it has a sort of, data, it's a document database so for each uh, key or ID or whatever you have um, like this JSON document and then you can do searches within these JSON documents. Um, and so the entire storage is based around that rather than based around tables. And then we've got Apache Cassandra. This is, um, you know, used by, I can't remember who developed this, but anyway, it's, uh, you know, high performance, scalability, high availability. It's got this kind of ring design. Uh, oh, yeah, that's it, yeah. Used by, like, Apple, Netflix, eBay. So it can handle, you know, 75,000 nodes, 10 petabytes data. So that's an awful lot of data, right? So it's very scalable, very large, um, and it gives you the atomicity, isolation, durability, but no consistency. That's the price you pay for this kind of scalability. And then in response to the no SQL, some people said, well, maybe the ACID stuff wasn't so bad. Maybe we could build bigger, more scalable databases that are ACID compliant. And so there's a sort of what's called new SQL, which are SQL databases that have ACID compliance and aim to provide the same scalability and performance as no SQL. So we got a Google Spanner, Clustrix, VaultDB, or MySQL cluster. Now, traditionally, well, initially these databases just run on a single machine, possibly high spec machine, and then as we're moving towards these more scalable databases, um, they've been, you know, t traditionally run on racks of servers on the company's premises, or on some kind of provider, server provider or server hosting kind of thing. So traditionally, you know, your company would have this, you know, big rack of servers, some kind of cold room, uh, where you go in and sort of you know, have all these different servers and these be running all the database software and have all the, to store all the data of the company. Problem with this is um, computers fail. Um, you know, location can be flooded, the company can burn to the ground, and you've also still got to, so you still got to mess around backing up the data, distributing it to a different physical location uh, in order to ensure that a single physical problem, physical problems don't compromise the entire, all the database of, of your company. Another problem with this is servers are expensive. You've got to pay for all that computing power, pay for all that power, pay for the cooling of the room and all this kind of stuff. And it's extremely expensive to hire people to manage these databases. You've got to install and hire the, run the servers. You've got to, it's going to be the hardware's going to fall over and die. The software's going to crash. Um, there's going to be like weird updates that break things more than they fix things. And, so, and you've got to do all the backup and mechanical and all the copying across different physical locations. So there's a lot of costs associated with these servers that you've got to have in your company. Never mind the space as well, you've got to pay for. It's also very difficult to plan the servers. Um, you know, if you start, you've got a new startup, um, you know, you, you say, well, you know, I'm 
planning to have a million customers in one year, but maybe that's not fixed. You know, maybe, maybe it's only going to be 10,000, maybe it's going to be 10 million, right? H how do you guess this? How do you get it accurately? So typically you have to guess how much storage you're going to need in one or two years. And so the mo most often you either have too little storage, too little database capacity, in which case you, you know, your databases are really slow you, and you can't serve your customers and you lose, lose business, or you have lots of hardware sitting around that you're just not using, which also costs you money. So the idea, and this has precipitated the move of companies to the cloud. So with the cloud, instead of companies having their own servers, putting their own in their own office space, companies are building warehouses for, that are filled with servers called server farms, and they're located where electricity, labor, and, um, well, not really so much labor, but definitely um, land and electricity are cheap. And then you have a dedicated team of engineers, and this is where the big cost saving comes. So the saving cost in terms of land and electricity and you're saving costs in terms of the engineers because to get a single disk image, you know, for, for like 10 machines costs the same as a disk image for like 1,000 machines or 10,000 machines. So you're getting great economies of scale here. And so companies such as Amazon or Google or Microsoft and lots of other companies as well build these enormous server farms and then let other people can use the computing, like use the databases on these server farms. Um, and then that's a much more efficient, much more scalable way in which people can build their databases. So here we have a data center with uh, 400,000 servers. So an awful lot of computing power in there, and then anyone who wants a bit of computing power can just use a few of the servers on that machine. So it's flexible, right? That's one of the big advantages. No long, you don't have to guess how much server capacity you're going to need and buy the machines. You can just uh, scale as you need and just pay a bit more for the cloud services. You don't have to hire and train staff to do all the low-level maintenance of the operating system and the machines and all this kind of stuff. You just need to hire the programmers who know how to use the, who then use the cloud services to store and retrieve the data. You've got all the replication done for you. You know, Amazon's pretty reliable, for example. They claim like 99.99% availability for S3 and economies of scale. So, you know, they're building their 400,000 machine uh, server farm. It's going to be a lot more efficient than you trying to have your own little mini server farm in your company. So, to, you know, an analogy for this would be, suppose that each person had to generate their own electricity, right? You'd have to first, you know, do some measurements of all the devices around your home and make a guess about how many future devices you're going to have to get an estimate of your power consumption in winter and summer. That's going to take you a bit of effort. And then you're going to have to make it, then you're going to probably have to order more, elect more equipment that you need. You're going to have to then buy, you know, solar panels, maybe a backup generator, all this kind of stuff. You're going to have to maintain it, clean the solar panels, buy petrol for the generator, you know, the generator will break from time to time, all this kind of stuff, buy the fuel, so on and so forth. So you're going to spend a lot of time and money uh, buying all the bits and bobs you need for your electricity, um, making some guesses about how much electricity you're going to need. Um, and it's all going to be a, a, a considerable hassle. On the other hand, what we have now is we have people building these enormous power stations, you know, wind farms, uh, nuclear power stations and so on, and then you're getting the economies of scale because they're generating huge amounts of electricity with, you know, uh, on a bigger scale, which is saving a lot of costs. And so I'm saving all the hassle of buying my, doing all my small-scale electricity generation, which is quite expensive, and then, um, I'm also, and then I'm getting the economies of scale by getting other people to generate it for me. And it's just like how cloud computing works. Instead of paying for my own computer storage and my own computer processing, I can get other people to do the computer storage and processing in a server farm. And that works out best for everyone, really. So another move, reason for moving towards the cloud is that uh, the amount of data that we're storing and using is, is increasing massively every year. So in some, um, some areas of scientific research, we're generating, you know, how much we're talking? We're talking, I think we're talking petabytes of data in particle physics, for example. So we're getting large amounts of data that we're needing to process. And so it, much more, it makes much more sense to store the data in the cloud and then process the data in the cloud as well. Okay, so there's lots of, um, so that's from a scientific point of view and from a scientific point of view as well. Um, if you're doing like a research project, it makes much more sense um, to uh, have like a budget for cloud storage and cloud data processing um, rather than to actually buy the machines at the beginning of the project and sell the machines at the end of the project. So my PhD, I had to buy a couple of machines to do some process data processing, and then they were just like redundant at the end of the project. Whereas it's much, if you've got huge amounts of data, it's much better to just pay for cloud storage and use the cloud storage. Okay, 
So that's all the good stuff about the cloud. What's, what are the limitations here? Well, if the cloud goes down, you're stuffed, right? If you completely depend on the cloud for storing um, and retrieving your data, and there's a farm in the data farm, in the, you know, a fire in the data farm in Ireland or whatever, and the, you know, the, it could take a while to get your data back, um, you're basically stuffed and you're relying on network connections being up. So if the internet service provider goes down, you're also stuffed. It can be difficult to move data between companies. So if Amazon you know, goes bust or whatever, you know, it could be very difficult to retrieve my data and move it to another company. So I'm still gonna have to have some kind of backups of my data. And there's issues about privacy, security in the country in which data is stored. And I've talked about all these in the lecture on the lectures on security, privacy, and legal issues. Uh, so I've mainly been focusing on cloud data storage by cloud companies like uh, large server farms. Some, farm, some companies use their own private clouds, so there's like cloud service providers, probably IBM, people like that do this kind of stuff. But I'm really just focusing on uh, cloud services provided by companies such as Amazon, and in particular Amazon in this talk. Okay, so when I prepared all this, um, I spent some time getting Amazon working, the Amazon Web Services, and that was fairly straightforward. And I spent some time trying to get the Google Cloud services running, and that was harder, and in the end I just gave up and said, well, let's just stick with Amazon, it's only an example anyway. Um, so I think it's easier to get running. I don't have any particular affiliation with Amazon, but one thing I do like about them, well, I like their web services, but I also like the fact that uh, they have an Educate account now, which I'll explain later, so that you can also have some first-hand experience of doing all this stuff without signing up with a credit card or any of this kind of business. So I'm gonna be focusing on Amazon, just as an example, and to give you something that you can use in your mini project, which has this cloud storage requirement. So, um, Amazon has lots and lots of different web services. You know, they've got a lot of powerful stuff out there. So we're gonna be focusing on S3 here in this talk. So we've got, these are the sort of storage and content delivery, and they've got a bunch of database like DynoDB, uh, you know, ugh, you know, different elastic file system, um, various ones. The one we care about here is S3, which I'm gonna explain in detail. S3 is simple storage service, key value storage of objects, so you have a key for that object, and then the, the, the value of that object is just an array of bytes, and that array of bytes can be a Java object, it can be a video, it can be an image, it can be a document, it can be a string, whatever you like, everything can be converted into arrays of bytes, and you can just store it in S3. You only pay for the storage which you use. That's the beautiful thing about cloud storage. Um, and we're gonna be using this in your mini projects and I'll be explaining in some detail how you can actually get all that running in this talk. Okay, so just, just like a little bit of an overview. So you can select the region in which the data is stored. So you can choose to store your data in like uh, Ireland or the United States, for example. And this has all the ramifications in terms of legal issues and this kind of stuff. You know, it backs up across different facilities. You can retrieve, you can do versioning with this, which is quite handy. And so if you accidentally delete something, you can then recover it later. And you're only, yeah, so you only pay for the storage you use. So they've got this different pricing levels. Again, if you're a business, this is useful. It doesn't really matter here. We've got like a, you know, standard where you can get it quickly, um, but it's a little bit more expensive. And then you can have like infrequent access in Glacier. So you can archive stuff for a long time. And maybe it's, it's really slow to access. So you've got to move it into standard to access it. I don't know the details, but you know, you can save a bit of money if you've got huge amounts of data that you just need to archive. And you can even have policies that automatically archive or glacierize your data if that's necessary. You've got some nice policies. You can do really detailed policies. I messed around with this the first time around this course. I haven't bothered with it this time. So you can limit people's access to particular buckets and so on. Um, you can have SSL, which is quite nice, like encryption to, to access the cloud, which is pretty important. And you can encrypt data client side uh, as well if, if you need to. So the idea is um, for Amazon S3 is that it's based on buckets. So it's a nice intuitive idea. You have a bucket and you chuck your data in the bucket. And the data consists of this key and the value, which is this array of bytes. Buckets are created in a particular region. As I said, this is implications performance privacy because different data laws apply to different regions, um, as you'll see. And each bucket has to have this globally unique ID. So no one else in the entire world can use the same name as your bucket, and you can't use the same name for, a name for your bucket that's already taken by the S3 service. It's quite easy to do though, you can either like spend 20 years kind of guessing different names like Pete, Pete1, Pete123 or whatever, but the easy way to do it is to use the Java UUI, unique ID class. Um, so 
so what I do in the, in the code is we, I give it a name like test bucket one, and then I append this long string which is generated by the Java UUID class, and so, I, so I'm pretty much guaranteed that this whole string is going to be unique. So I can, then I can easily create my own unique buckets in code without having to try and guess and mess around and have lots of failures. So yeah, this is like the name that I've given to it, so I know what it means. And this is like a little dash, and then this is like a bunch of, bunch of stuff that, you know, generated by this UUID class, um, which is in theory guaranteed to be unique. So buckets contain objects. Uh, the key, key of each object is a string that has to be unique just within the bucket. So you don't have to be globally unique with the names of object, keys for objects. And the value of the object is just this array of bytes, which can be a string, integer, document, Java object, video, whatever you like. Anything that can be stored in a computer can be converted to an array of bytes. And they've got more sort of fancy sort of metadata, like a version ID, you know, name value pairs, information about the object, access control information, and then the values, anything up to five terabytes. So you can store big stuff on this if you need to. So um, to convert what you're storing into a array of bytes, so if you've got a string or if you've got a video or whatever, then one way to do this is convert it to an input stream, pass the input stream to the S3 put object request, and then S3 will just do, do the work for you of um, writing that stream into the bucket. And then to retrieve it, you just uh, request the object by bucket name and object key, and then S3 returns an S3 object, which can be converted to a reader, and then you can just use read line or whatever to get the bytes out of the object. I'm gonna go through some code in a bit, so don't worry too much about you know, committing every facet of this to memory just now. Okay, so that's, that's a little bit of an overview explaining um, you know, what S3 is all about and why I chose S3. And now we're gonna actually go into the details of how you can use it, and, I'm gonna give you, and I've given you some example codes that you can then adapt most sensibly into a wrapper that you can then use in your mini projects. So let's get down to the nuts and bolts of it and see how it works. So first thing we need is an account. Uh, so everyone needs an account in order to be able to use S3. So the way they do this is the AWS Educate Starter account, which gives you free access to pretty much all uh, AWS services. You don't need a credit card. So the first, first year I taught this course, it was a bit of a nightmare because you could only get like a, uh, a trial account and Students are signing up with their credit cards, and I was like, oh my, you know, you know, dear me. Um, you know, then maybe they'll forget to cancel it and have some like enormous like bill at the end of the, end of the year. But the good news is they've changed this. So now we can uh, sign up for an AWS Educate Starter account um, with no credit card. It's very easy, and they just have this simple email verification and job done. So um, sign up at that link. Then you choose your role your student, right? And then you get all this like, uh, you know, application stuff, which is pretty basic. And then I think you need to, yeah. You don't enter an AWS account ID. You're much better off selecting AWS Educate Starter Account. Um, so just change that bullet point. Make sure you select that point there. And then, you know, when you signed up with the um, email verification, you'll get a link to this uh, Quick Labs, um, which is where you need to, where you, where you have access to the um, console, which you'll need, and access to the keys, which you'll also need, the credentials keys. So once you've got to here, you click on Start Lab, and then we get here, it's, it, the looks changed slightly since I did these slides, but it's pretty much the same. You've got um, two things here that you're gonna need is the management console and the access keys. So sign up, create the account, get to here, and then you're almost there in terms of getting this all running. So the next step is, um, you know, is to sort things out, sort your machine out such, so that it can authenticate itself with Amazon. Obviously, you don't want anyone being able to store and retrieve things in your particular buckets. They could delete all your data, they could access your customer's information, all the rest of it. So you need some way in which your code can authenticate itself with Amazon. And how it works is you've got what's called an access key and a secret access key, and these need to be passed to the Amazon Web Services so that the code can prove um, that is the source of these requests, the requests that are being sent to them. So to get your access keys, you click on this button in the console called Show Access Keys, and then this will bring up the access keys here. So I've, I've blurred mine out because I don't particularly want other people using my account, but, uh, and so you should always, as I'll say later, you should always take care of your access keys. So this gives you the access key ID and the secret access key. So you just copy these, and I'll explain what you're gonna do with them in a second. So your program has to pass these access keys to the AWS, and there's different ways in which you can do this. One way you can do this is using uh, 
environment variables, so you can mess around in Windows or Linux, or whatever, setting these environment variables, and then that should work. Haven't tried it, but it should work. You can have Java system properties. Again, haven't got a clue how you do that, but there's some way in which you can set system properties in Java, and you can do it that way. What I'm going to tell you how to do is the, I find the easiest way, is what's called the default credentials profile file. So in Linux or Windows, this will be like your sort of user directory, um, .aws credentials. And in Windows, it's a file that's located in like your C user's username slash at the root, root of your user directory. And then there's a folder called .aws, and then there's a credentials file there. I'm going to explain this in a little bit of detail. There's a little bit of explanation there. This credential file contains your access key and a secret access key for your apps and web services. You just knock it up using Notepad++. I've given you a template to download, which you can use to start, get you started. And all it's got is these two, these two like variables, setting AWS access key ID, and there is where you put your access key, and that's where you put your secret access key. And then you just store it at UC users, username, slash, little folder, and then credentials. So in my case, this is like David269, something like that, and then I'll show you, I'll show you an example in a second. In Windows, it's a little bit tricky because we need to store, we need to create a folder called .aws, um, but Windows won't let you create a new folder called .aws, but there's a workaround. What you do is you create a, no, this isn't showing correctly, but uh, you create a folder called um, .aws. So it's got a dot at both ends, and then Windows will automatically delete the trailing dot and then give you a folder called .aws. You might be able to just use mine. And then this is inside the credentials file. This is all it contains, just these two fields, AWS access key or D, AWS secret access key, and then you just put your credentials in there. Take care of your credentials file, because anyone who can, wants to change things on your AWS web services can do it once they've got your credentials file. So don't submit it with your projects, don't give it to friends, don't post it online, you know, don't commit it to a, like a source, open source uh, management re repository. The lab machines are reset anyway, but they're not necessarily, they're only completely wiped, I think, when you reboot them. So just, just take great care of your credentials file, okay? Right. So that's the credentials file. Um, if I probably, while we're on it, I might as well just show you here. So, uh, so here we have, you see it? Yeah, so computer, local disk, so it's, this is C, users, David269 and I've copied the credentials file .aws into here, and there's the credentials file. And I think I've even given you the, um, uh, I've even given you the templates. One minute, that's in here. Yeah, so here I've given you the folder anyway, so you don't need to mess around with that. All you do is go into here, edit this credentials file, which looks as I've showed you, and then bung it in the appropriate directory in your computer, and then, you sh and then it should just work. All right, so we set up the credentials, so now code can authenticate itself with Amazon uh, S3, Amazon Web Services. So now we need to set up development environment in order to you know, uh, write a program that then can communicate with, the web, with S3. So we're going to use NetBeans, going to check the Java version, and then obtain uh, appropriate Amazon libraries. But there's a little bit of an issue about uh, early versions of Java. You shouldn't I imagine you're not running before 1.6, but just in case, be aware that if you're going to use SSL, which you don't need to do in your project anyway, so it should be fine, but just, just be aware of this if you do uh, have problems with that. Then we have the Amazon Web Services Software Development Kit. Uh, you could download it and extract the relevant bits. I think I've given you a list of JAR files, uh, but you don't need to because I've already done that for you. I've already extracted the JAR files, but if you want to see the... Um, and I think the uh, API documentation is also is available online anyway. So you don't necessarily need to download this, but if you're doing this like later outside of this course or whatever, then you can do, you download this entire 400 megabytes um, software development kit, and that gives you everything that you need to uh, do build software and talk to Amazon S3 and so on and so forth. And gives you the examples, credentials file template, and so on. I basically fished out the bits you need and put them on the course website. But if you do this later and you don't, you don't have and you don't have access to the course website, then you might need to do all this. And then you've got the API reference, which is kind of handy if you want to drill down to all the different you know things it can do. And then we need to configure NetBeans um, by adding um, 
the following library. So I'm not going to go into details or show you exactly how to do it, but in NetBeans, you've got uh, S3, you've got, here's my, here's my source packages and here's my libraries. And so you need to make sure that this, all the required libraries are here. And all you do that, you right click on libraries, add jar folder, and select the libraries from your, from your computer. And I recommend that you download the jars, these jars from the um, course website, bung them in like a lib folder or something in your code, in your code folder, and then just add them in, add them in like that. Okay. So we create a standard Java application, add these libraries, because it needs these libraries in order to talk to the S3. Right, so yeah, so we've gone into all that. Um, and then I've given you this example code. So I've given you some code. Um, it's closely based on Amazon's example code. All it does is creates a new bucket, adds a string and an object to that bucket, and then it downloads a string and an object from that bucket. So, my rec so you've got two tasks that you're going to need to do in your mini project, as I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Your tasks are to uh, store third-party data in Amazon S3, and then download this data from S3, um, and then pass it back to the user. So the servlet's going to do the downloading, and maybe a different program is going to do the uploading, like uh, some kind of you know, web scraping type thing. So my recommendation is um, that you take this example code, and then you adapt it and make it into like a little wrapper um, which has, which, and so you can basically use it mostly as is, but then you just need to adapt it a little bit to turn it into a wrapper, and then both your web scraping code and your servlet code can then use that wrapper to access Amazon Web Services. That's my recommendation. So, um, so we've got the code sorted. Um, the final bit is the management console. And the management console is very handy because it lets you view the contents um, of buckets. And so you probably going to have to log in say, through your AWS Educate account. So I'll just show you. So um, let's just see. So here we have our, yeah. So this is what the AWS Educate Quick Labs things look like now. It's just slightly different arrangements. So you've got the access keys there, and then you've got the management console there. You just click on Open Console, and it'll open it, open it up like that. And then you can click on S3. And if you've got something in there, which I have, I've got my test bucket in there already. So I've already run the code, but I'll just show you now. So here's the code. I think that's where we're at in terms of the, yep. So here's the code. Um, I wonder if I can show you all the, all the various methods here. Yeah, so here's, this, here's the methods we've got here. I won't go into any details. So, <coughs> so this, Basically, a bunch of very useful methods, such as add bucket, add objects in file, add string objects, checks whether the bucket exists. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you can create a file, delete objects, download objects, get bucket names, so on. So this code has a bunch of very useful methods. So you're welcome to use that and adapt it into a wrapper, which you can use in your project. And the main part of this project, so the main part of this code uh, has like a main. I don't know if I've even included the main. I think it just runs a new S3 test. And the S3 test, um, establishes the connection to AWS using this credentials file. So this, this for example, this, this initialization code could be in the init method of the server, for example. And then you've got basic tests, so it creates a bucket, uploads the, uploads the bucket, adds the bucket, adds some files to the bucket, and downloads some files to the bucket. And once you've got that code running successfully, you should be able to see the bucket in your management console. You click on the bucket, and then you can see the test object and the test string. So, it's a good, so this console is a great way in which you can check that your code's working and that it's uploading the correct data uh, to Amazon Web Services. Okay. Oh yeah, well I'm not so sure the code running, so let's just let's just run it. Um, okay, so it should run. So here you go. When you run the code, uh, this is what you should see. So it tells you uploading new object to S3, adding object from a file, and then it downloads the object and outputs the object that it's downloaded. So if you can get this running, it looks a bit like that, then you've succeeded, and you should check the console, make sure it's uh, uploaded to your account, not some, some other account or whatever. So yeah, once you run it, we should see the new bucket and see the contents of the new bucket. So I said, you could uh, welcome to adapt this code in your projects. For example, you could uh, initialize Amazon S3 in the init method of your servlet, and then call the methods to add objects, read objects in response to HTTP methods. 
So as I said, I recommend you turn it into a wrapper for S3. That's the easiest way to do this. OK, so there's 15 marks available for storing and retrieving data in Amazon S3. So here we go. So website displays data stored in Amazon S3. Uses then generates data or download for third party. So there's 10 marks for the basics, storing data in S3 and retrieving it from S3. And there's five marks um, if that data is third party data. So if you've got your web scraper to store the data from a third party in S3 and then you download it from the server and display it to the user, you get the full 15 marks. So we are going to go through all this in labs. So don't, you know, there will be lots of support to help you get all this running. So don't, don't worry too much about this. Ah, uh, ba 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 ba, yep. So the purpose of this, in a way, is that if you're using third party data, um, you don't want to pull that data every time someone wants to access it from your website. You want to pull that data, store it in the cloud, and then if the other third party website is down or something breaks in the scraping code, then you, 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 know, you can just pull it straight from the cloud and you've got like a cache and you, it's a more resilient way of doing it. So using cloud to cache your data and the web scraper maybe runs once per day, stores data in the cloud, and then the servlet accesses the data when the client requests the page. So the servlet's storing it from time to time and then the server's accessing it in response to requests from the client, which could happen a lot, could happen a thousand times a second, right? Um, you could also store user data in the cloud. Um, so if you want to have user accounts, for example, S3 would be a good way to do that. Or you can even track users with cookies and, you know, and then use, just store like an ID of, in the cookie about which user's browsing the website and then have the full data stored in the cloud. There's lots of ways in which you can do, use the cloud storage. You can use JavaScript to access Amazon Cloud data. Um, you don't need to do this with a servlet. I'm not, I haven't shown you how to do this. I haven't given you any code for that because I haven't got it working myself. But it might be, might be a little bit fiddly because of cross-origin request uh, security restrictions. Um, so my recommendation is that you use Java to store and access your data in S3. So yes, JavaScript might be possible. If you want to get JavaScript working, absolutely fine. Um, but the only sort of concrete path that I've given the support for or explanation for is the Java one. So you'd, you're on your own. If you want to get JavaScript working, I can try and give you a hand. But the main, you know, I recommend you use Java because I've given you all the code and the code works. Okay. So in this lecture, I've given you some background about SQL, new SQL, new SQL and explained how you can store data in the cloud using S3, and also how you can use it in your mini projects. So next lecture, I'm going to look at some of the technologies behind large-scale commercial websites. So.